the hand wringing continues, the search for answers or scapegoats, as the people of Afghanistan are once again betrayed. A disaster almost two decades in the making, or should we say four decades, as it was the US who funded the Mujahideen to facilitate the overthrow of the Soviet-backed government in Afghanistan in the 1980s. And today we see the successor to the Mujahideen in the form of the Taliban. At the weekend, I spoke with Megan Cornish, Seattle civil rights activist and member of Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party. And to put the conversation into a context, I focused first on Barbara Lee, a Democratic representative from California, who in the days after 9-11-2001 gave a speech on the House floor warning that the approving of the so-called authorization of the use of military force would see the US embarking on an open-ended war with neither exit strategy nor a focused target. And asked her what her memories were of that speech. That's a good point. She certainly uh, got that totally right. At the time, we had no idea that this was going to become a forever war, and it certainly is. Talk about the lies that were told at that time of why the U.S. had to go to war once again. That is so amazing and not being talked about, you know, with our corporate media. First, they said it was because the Taliban wouldn't give up Osama bin Laden. But actually, early on, the Taliban had indicated a willingness to talk about extraditing him either to the U.S. or Saudi Arabia, our big buddy. Then the other things that supposedly the U.S. was all about was, and of course the Allies, liberating women, nation building, and bringing democracy to Afghanistan, all of which was obviously hot air, (laughs) because after not doing all of that, they're leaving only 20 years later. Well, let's talk about that issue of women. We don't hear the U.S. talking about the situation for women in their great mate Saudi Arabia or other Middle Eastern countries. Right. And, you know, Saudi Arabia is almost as bad as the Taliban. As long as they're U.S. allies and play ball, then uh, we don't care about those issues. And you also have women and their situation now in the media. You know, you're not hearing, oh, dear, you know, these these women are being left in the lurch. There's not a word on that. There was also talk I heard or a, an article I read about the fact that violence against women was even extremely high before this takeover. Yes. And one of the things that I was really happy to be able do, to do in the in the article I wrote in the Freedom Socialist was reference some of the writing that was coming out of Afghanistan about that. There's a left-wing monthly that's being put out by a collaboration of different leftists, and they did a whole article in March this year on how appalling the situation was for women, and not just in the Taliban control under the, the government throughout the country. And also, another thing that has not been talked about much that this same monthly did an article on was the situation of youth, who are a huge proportion of the population. 70% of the country is under the age of 22. You know, we know that the girls have had a terrible time getting education, but they pointed out that in much of the country, schools have been closed throughout the war. So there's huge numbers of boys as well as girls who are illiterate, therefore have very little possibility of of life because they can't even read. Unemployment is sky high. You know, when they count the, the losses 
in terms of the, the war deaths and, and woundings, when you talk about combatants even, a lot of them are not people who had a choice. It was survival for them to either join the government military or the Taliban military or some of these many other parties that are fighting in Afghanistan, or were up until recently at least. Like you said, the unemployment was so high that that was virtually the only choice for many of those young people. That's right. That and the opium trade, which the U.S. has also had a lot to do with uh, fomenting. Talk about the, the opium trade. There were the stories that under the Taliban, the opium trade went down because they were paid to take out the crops. What's it been like under the occupation of the U.S.? What has happened in the opium fields? As I understand it, a lot of, by the Taliban, a lot of the profits from it were turned over to them. But also you have to look at the U.S., which has been all about promoting the profits of the drug companies. And we have the whole scandal in this country of rise of opiate addiction in this country, some of which was officially through prescription drugs. And of course, much of which, of which is also on the street drugs. But, you know, the same parties are getting rich off this trade on both sides of the war. You know, the U.S. and its allies having the gall to cast itself as the good guys. It's not. It's one group of bad guys against another group of bad guys. They're all making, making profits off the backs of the people. What were the promises for bringing democracy to Afghanistan? One of the phrases was nation building, uh, and they wanted to bring democratic values and yada, yada. And yet, in 2019, the Washington Post published the Afghanistan papers, which came from hundreds of interviews with people who were involved in war and over all administrations, Democratic and Republican. And they knew that corruption was rampant. A lot of the supposed reconstruction aid was going to things that were never built and just went into people's pockets. It was all a charade. Can you talk about the military-industrial complex. It's now being recognised that they are the real victors of this war and this occupation. Absolutely. The military contractors have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and the costs to the U.S. of the war, if you look at all of them, uh, not just uh, maintaining the war, but also taking care of uh, wounded soldiers after they come back and all of that. It's over $2 trillion. And that went into the hands of military contractors, largely. And now a lot of those weapons have been left behind? Yes, right. And once again, the Afghan people are being, are being stuck with the, these conditions, you know soldiers who have come back from Afghanistan, the injured, the psychologically disturbed. Is that an issue at all in the U.S.? Yes, I think it is. It probably will be more so as time goes on and people find that they're not getting the care that they need. Uh, it's cer that certainly was an issue for m many, many years after the Vietnam War. One of the things that makes me so angry is there are hundreds of thousands of Afghans who, who have the same kinds of physical and mental injuries, and they're not going to get help. Were there any hospitals, health centers built by the U.S. over those years to help the people of Afghanistan? I'm sure there was something done. I don't have facts and figures on actual things that were built that didn't immediately fall apart or that were never built. But I know overall the, the numbers are not good. Also, when the U.S. was doing a lot of bombing, they ended up 
bombing things like hospitals. So it goes in both directions, I guess. That's what I'm saying. The lies that were told to the U.S. public over the last years to make sure that this war, this occupation kept going. What sort of issues were they discussing on, on the media to hoodwink the people to believe that progress was being made, it's just a matter of time? Well, a lot of it, frankly, was by not talking about it. Considering the amount of money that was spent there and the huge proportion of the really tremendously bloated military budget went to this war, there was a lot of non-coverage of what was going on over there. There was some talk about the drone program, which, you know, got a lot of good press, even though what it's all about is killing lots and lots of civilians. They'd say a, a strike was a big success when it, uh, when they thought it may have killed a couple of Taliban officials, and they just wrote off the tens or hundreds of civilians that got caught in the crossfire. In your paper, you focus on war crimes by the US and NATO, and you're going to add Australia into that, and also the governments that they installed over the years. Can you expand on what you know and what the people know about those war crimes, what's been exposed? The U.S. had an absolutely massive prisoner torture program. Barack Obama explicitly declined to investigate George Bush's torture program. There was some media coverage of some of the uh, war crimes of just shooting people down, basically, for target practice. There was one man who, after many years, was found guilty and another soldier who was up to be prosecuted, and Trump pardoned them. You know, that was just blatant. We could care less. But, yeah, torture, killing civilians, you know, without regard, and sometimes even for sport. Have there been whistleblowers? There have, and there's been some very brave whistleblowers, and... Uh, most of them are in jail. Oh, I'm not going to remember his name now. There's a, a man who was just given something like five years for exposing the crimes of the U.S.'s drone program, which is not only in Afghanistan, but is largely there, and which, by the way, is going to keep on, according to the statements of the government, there's certainly, of course, the WikiLeaks, which involved Iraq, but also Afghanistan war crimes. And I think a lot of reality uh, winners' revelations also involved our war crimes. There's a, a number of others. Are you aware in the United States of alleged war crimes by Australian special forces? There is a a great deal of activity here at the moment to bring people to court. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. We don't hear that much about that here. Some pretty horrible stories have come out. I'm glad to hear it. Now that I know, I'll look it up. The Cost of War Project at Brown University, which you've included in your paper, what did that reveal? That was where I got the figure of over $2 trillion as the uh, money expense, but more so it's the death and destruction that has been wrought, including tens of thousands of government troops, thousands of Taliban troops, tens of thousands of civilians, and a the deaths don't get counted because they're indirect from, like, inability to get food and water after areas have been destroyed. Some of the numbers are an estimated 71,000 civilians, 78,000 Afghan soldiers, 84,000 opposition fighters. On the U.S. and the Allies' side, it was 
really unbalanced. It was 7,500 some. And then there's all the refugees. Now, some of the refugees come since the war. 2.7 million registered refugees from Afghanistan and 2 million people who are, were internally displaced up to this year. And as we know, with the chaos right now, it's more are being displaced as, as we speak. So it's just appalling destruction of people's lives. And when you think of the impact of climate change in that country, the temperatures there are, well, they always were high, but they're rising way into the 50s now. And you've got people who have, don't have a home, their crops are destroyed. It's a disaster, more of a disaster just waiting to happen. Yes, that's very true. And, and that connection with, with climate change is very often not made. But because of the displacement that goes on in these war zones where civilians are not considered is just a disaster. And then a lot of the refugees, they can't even leave now because the surrounding countries have closed their borders because they've got hundreds of thousands already. I'm glad you made, you made that connection because it is important. And also I should mention uh, as far as the uh, war crimes, specifics on war crimes, it's good to read Afghan sources on that. If people are interested in going to our website, socialism.com, look up my story on Afghanistan, Bullied, Bombed, and Betrayed. It has links on that page to a statement by the left radical of Afghanistan group uh, that they made about war crimes uh, in 2018. And these two stories on the the plight of women and the situation of the youth from the Etaraz uh, Monthly. And who are these left radicals? They are a socialist group that is Trotskyist in their ideas. The Taliban and all of those are just manipulating and using. I'm hoping that they're doing okay because... We haven't been in contact with them now for a month or so. They're a, a socialist group. They'd be targeted? I would think they would be. Certainly anybody who's known to stand up to the Taliban is in great peril right now. Top leaders of the Taliban are making noises about amnesty and all of this, but the reports on the ground is that that is not at all the case. Radicals are, are very much... Uh, in peril, and journalists in particular also. I've been reading on a couple of journalist groups, especially there's a a new one that was started the end of last year, a collective of women journalists that is trying to, you know, report the news from women's standpoint, which doesn't get covered much. And also the... uh, Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan group, because they are opponents of the Taliban, they were also opponents of the U.S. occupation, they are in peril, as are professionals of all kinds. Some of them have been getting murdered. There's also a great deal of concern for the ethnic minorities. Yes, definitely. One of the biggest terror attacks of the Taliban was the destruction of a girls' school and the killing of some 85 girls who were part of the Hazara Shiite ethnic minority as well. Those groups are also very much in peril. We're hearing stories now about young women who have been educated They're burning their books, they're burning their degrees, they're burning everything that connects them to education because they're too frightened because they realise that if if they're identified as educated women, they'll be targeted. Yet these young women, when they go try to go to overseas, they have no qualifications at all. It's all gone down the drain. Right. The classic catch-22. 
it's a very scary situation there. And one of the bright spots is that a, a lot of people internationally are, are trying to figure out how to send money to help people, but it's hard to know how to do that and get it into the right hands, too. Things need to settle down a little bit before you can think about that? Yes, perhaps. I did do some research in the last couple of days and found uh, actually my women's group, Radical Women, has a couple of statements, one from the Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan, RAWA, on its website, and they have a link organization that will get money to them. There's also this collective of women journalists has a crowdfunding site that you can go to and give money to them. Probably the best way to find it is to look up the Guardian article that was published a couple of days ago talking about the group, and it has, at the, at the bottom of the article, it has a link to send money. And then there's also the International Federation of Journalists, which is a union, and they have a safety fund for uh, Afghan journalists. They are focusing on the women and helping women get, get out of the country if they, you know, if they feel they have to. We've seen dreadful scenes at the airport of people being stopped from leaving. What other avenues are there for people to leave? Well, that's a good question. I think that's one reason why they're they're continuing to be crowds of people trying to get through. I have to say, you know, as a tiny glimmer of truth of hope is, you know, there's indication that people are fighting back. There was there were reports in our papers a, a day or so ago about a spontaneous demonstration against the Taliban which took a lot of courage for people to do, and I believe they're popping up in other places around the country. Then this was before the Taliban takeover, but there were a number of demonstrations in in the north and west of the country where women demonstrated and marched with assault rifles, saying, we're willing to fight. They may end up having to. Are you concerned also that the U.S. might not leave? Yes. The indication seems to be that the perspective is that the troops themselves will leave. But Biden has said that the drone program is going to go on. That means bombing is going to go on, keep going on, will be even less visible in the U.S. and people around the world what's going on because they don't have the boots on the ground. So that's a big concern, I think. What would you like to see happening right at this moment? More organizing, more protests. It's important for those of us who are outside of Afghanistan and support the rights of of those people to find ways to give solidarity as much as as we can and pressure our governments not to just shove this under the carpet. One thing that we called for in my story was paying war reparations. The U.S. ripped up that country for 20 years, and it should pay reparations, and it should provide real reconstruction aid. And meanwhile, those of us who are, are on the left, we can find labor organizations and women's organizations, hopefully at some point radical organizations to contribute to and aid. We really need more, a a stronger anti-war movement. You know, I was around during the Vietnam anti-war movement, and that was easier because people were getting drafted and sent over there, so there was much more passion in the U.S., The only thing the U.S. learned from that war was not to have a draft so that, uh, you know, would make the the anti-war movement much much weaker, and it, it has. Can I read to you a couple of sentences from a source who said, 
At first glance, the debacle in Afghanistan implies a failure of the Biden administration. But on a deeper historical level, it represents the demise of Western domination in world affairs. What began with the fall of colonisation and imperialism in the last century has finally ended with American realisation that it cannot impose its way of life on a distant nation with an alien culture merely by force. I love it. I hope that it's true. Looking back at Vietnam and then to Afghanistan, uh, they didn't listen. They didn't learn the lesson before. But if they have learned it this time, that would be good. Except that actually, the U.S. and other countries are still making wars in other countries in Africa and in North Africa and the Middle East. They're continuing to stick their fingers in and thinking that they can control other countries, even though they've learned many times that they can't. They're very slow learners because, because of, you know, how profitable it is, whether or not they win. So it's only profitable for a few. Right. You know, the source of the problem is capitalism. We have to get better at pointing to the real source, making international solidarity among working people of all colors and sexes and sexualities and abilities, because we're the only ones who can make things better in this world. I would love to keep communicating with, with you and with other people about how we work together going forward. There's been a lot of hopeful events in terms of fight back of, of recent years, I look forward to us joining together more closely in those, in those battles to fight for each other. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks very much. You've been listening to an interview with Megan Cornish, Seattle civil rights activist and a member of Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party.